Well, thanks for coming. Uh, my name is Mike Merwicki. David Dean. Uh, we're your state representatives here in the Wyndham Four District, Putney, Dummerston, Westminster. We're here at the Putney Firehouse, and uh, just open it up to anyone and anyone that comes to ask questions. We'll probably uh, we can start with a statement of what we've been doing, what we hope to be doing in the next session. Uh, David is the chair of the committee we call Wet and Wild, mm -hmm. Fish, Wildlife, and Water Resources. And David is also, uh, I call David the Dean of the House, uh, even though he's not quite the longest standing member. But David is uh, the, the keeper of the rules of the House for us. Uh, he, he does a, a workshop every year on the rules. He's on the Rules Committee, and you can explain a little bit about what that is and what they do. And you want to. Sure. Uh, rules Committee. Uh, the House Rules Committee um, is there to, it manages the House, uh, I guess is the best way to say it. And um, there, from session to session, there are good and sufficient reasons to change the rules. Uh, two examples. Um, the standing committees of the House are recommended by the Rules Committee to the full body. And six years ago, we created a health care committee and made it a standing committee so that the legislature had a focus point for the work in terms of moving towards um, uh, single payer and equal access uh, to health care services. Um, this past year, there were uh, concerns, public concerns, that uh, members of the House um, were not exercising their best judgment in terms of conflict of interest. And so uh, the House Rules Committee uh, made a recommendation to the full body to create an ethics panel where uh, if there are concerns from the public or from other members, those concerns can be brought to the panel and that the panel can then investigate. In other words, there's focus as opposed to 13 or 15 or 18 speeches on the floor of the House to try and address um, something that is that important to other House members. Uh, and then what Michael was talking about in terms of being keeper of the rules the House is governed by Mason's rules, and they are As written, opposed to Robert's rules. As opposed to Robert's rules, as opposed to the Jefferson <laughs> rules that the U.S. Congress uses. State legislatures have their own uh, uh, manual of rules of procedure, what's in order, what's not in order, um, and how you move from stage to stage in terms of passing legislation. and. Um, uh, I probably more than anyone else in the House uh, will raise points of order on the floor during debate or when a motion has been made uh, because it is not in fact in keeping with the Mason's procedure that's set out in the rules. And I have a book of Mason's about that thick. It's, it's small, but it's about that thick <laughs> in my desk. and. Um, um, you know, I'll start hearing, you know, start looking um, in Masons uh, so that if I do raise a point of order that I'm within the rules uh, in terms of what my concern is. So as an example, one, one of the rules is that when you stand and speak on the house of the floor, you can address an issue that's been raised, but you cannot question or suggest motives to what somebody's saying. Right, in terms of why they might be doing this uh, uh, or why they might be debating in this way. You also can't use individual names. Right. Um, you're not David Dean or Mike Marwicki. You're the member from Putney, the member from Westminster, um, and it that bleeds over into, and this is something that we're getting better about it and I'm working towards it. 
as part of a report of a bill on the floor, you will talk to who did your committee speak with? And the appropriate way is to say uh, someone representing the League of Cities and Towns, someone representing a watershed organization, someone representing a business organization, as opposed to John Doe, Jane Doe, and Rick <laughs> in terms of what you announce uh, on the floor. Is that to keep it general? It's to keep it general and to uh, depersonalize. I see. As Michael said, keep it the, civil. The, the, the debate <laughs> should be on the issues. It's okay to say, I think this is a terrible idea. It's not okay to say, I think you <laughs> are terrible because you had this idea. Um, and there's a big difference, and that it, it builds civility. Um, and some years are better than others in terms of how people um, uh, are careful about that. And if they're not careful, <coughs> then there are people like me who will, in fact, raise a point of order, um, which is as close as we get to the parliamentary form of uh, legislative um, uh, uh, decorum in that when you raise a point of order, you simply jump to your feet and yell, point of order. <laughs> and then you grab hold of your microphone and explain why you're raising the point of order. But And then the speaker decides whether you are in order or yep. finds for or against you. Yeah. Yep. And is the speaker appointed? We elect our speaker, yeah. and um, last uh, last biennium, no one opposed Shat. Um, mm -hmm. And in, in most situations, there's always some kind of contest, but last session there wasn't. And it's usually Very unusual. somebody from the majority party. Mm -hmm. I think the last time somebody was elected as a member of a minority party was when Tim O'Connor of Brattleboro was elected as Speaker of the House as a member when the Democrats were in the minority, which I think says a lot for Tim O'Connor and how well respected he was mm -hmm. on sure. both sides of the aisle. Mm -hmm. Sure, sure. Well, keeping things not personal um, and moving forward when there have to be some egos in the room, because honestly, if you do a lot of work with something, you're you're personally invested in sure. it, mm -hmm. whether yeah. you like it or not, you are. Yeah. So, yeah, you so bet. yeah, so that must be quite a chore. So these are Mason rules? Mason's uh, rules of procedure, legislative rules of procedure. Yeah. 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 Cool. Now, last year, your committee did a lot of work on trying to get to the point where we can help clean up Lake Champlain and how we can also affect some short buffer zones mm -hmm. on all Vermont waterways, right? What's the status of this? <laughs> well, we got lakes. Uh, there are now minimum standards for protection of um, lake shorelands and uh, protecting the native vegetation um, along the edge of lakes. Um, and in some ways, Rivers is moving forward with legislation that we passed uh, in previous years, and we gave the agency a responsibility to come up with, uh, this is a mouthful, fluvial erosion hazard zones. <laughs> Most people think of floods and they think of FEMA and whatever, and uh, they have maps and, and anybody that's in the uh, local government knows that. FEMA only deals with inundation floods. In other words, the water rises too high. And, you know, that's a problem. Uh, but rivers not only flood, meaning the water rises, they move. And um, giving a river its due in terms of what it's likely to do at high water and whatever is that fluvial erosion hazard zone. And a lot of them don't show up on FEMA flood maps uh, because, again, FEMA's you know, rising water. Um, I, many people probably saw some of the pictures in the paper of uh, a house 
obviously not in the floodplain, half of which is hanging over the side of a hill that the river eroded out, you know? And the, so what we're trying to do is capture that, get those maps to towns, and as part of the procedure of adopting those regulations at the local level, they will have riparian buffers uh, as part of that corridor uh, that they want the towns to adopt rules for to allow rivers to do what they do, which is wander. Uh, so, Did you know that there is um, a lot going on concerning the floodplain here through Putney? Because um, we were asked to um, value easements uh, that exist. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a group um, that called TransCanada. And do you know about TransCanada? So they, so they use the water to make happen what they need to happen. And they have easements that's on property here in Putney. Flowage rights. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And the state hired a group called San Susie to come up with values that they recommended to the towns to use. And that they um, vastly were different from what um, the company that uses the waterway and uses the easements came up with. So, so there is a lot of talk in the towns right now, all the river towns, about that, about flowage rights and about the easements associated with it. Because it isn't just the water flooding, it's how high the water can be or how low the water can be. And of course, it's a, it's a moving thing. So the easements aren't just for the edge mm -hmm. or the land. Right, yeah, no, flowage rights reach back as far as, well, as far as the landowner's willing to mm -hmm. uh, sell those easements to um, someone who raises the level of the river um, and in uh, they trans canada uh, is in court uh, with three towns around barnett a couple towns down on the deerfield um, and um, they, of course they've been in court with bellows falls and and uh, others that's uh, a really uh, complicated issue. At one point, it got so strange. I haven't, for all my legislative life, served on environmental committees. I have served on Ways and Means, mm -hmm. and um, we put a moratorium in place when the dams were first sold uh, from New England Power to Pacific Gas and Electric. Uh, Pacific Gas and Electric was uh, really rabid in terms of uh, fighting the tax uh, valuation. Mm -hmm. uh, and we just slapped a, a moratorium on changing values until the state could get something figured out. Mm -hmm. And they're back at it. Now it's TransCanada um, that bought them from PG&E. Right. It was much nicer having a New England-based owner uh, for these facilities, uh, who uh, seemingly was a better neighbor uh, mm -hmm. than the foreign owners that have uh, owned the dams twice now. And of course, I'll just say it to say it, we should have bought them. <laughs> and uh, that uh, commission that was put in place to evaluate that for the uh, state uh, was stacked against, uh, it was stacked to get the answer that we got, no, we shouldn't buy them. And uh, that's unfortunate. Mm -hmm. Well, change being constant, we'll see. Yeah, we'll Perhaps see. Perhaps it comes up again. I mean, there's no doubt that what's happening now in the courts will set precedent mm -hmm. for what goes on. Because the easements are already bought. They go with the land. Yep, yep. They go with the land. Yeah. So this is a broader question, but can relate to this, so both of you could jump in. So how much of the rules process are you discussing as a legislator um, as opposed to 
you know, ANR, Agency of Natural Resources, and kind of creating the rules that um, essentially will guide the, the law into implementation. There's a separate committee, the legislative uh, LCAR. Legislative Committee on Administrative Rules. Got which it. is a, okay, appointed yeah. um, some That's, senators, some, some yep. House members, and they oversee the rules that agencies make. Okay. To implement, you know, we, we create legislation, the administration creates rules to implement that legislation, and then LCAR, is that right? Mm -hmm. Then is the check to make yeah. sure the intent of the legislation is matched up with the rules. Um, so are either of you on LCAR? Uh, no, we no. did have Dick Mayer, Representative Dick Mayer from okay. Newfane has been our our local and will be until January. Yeah, until yeah. his replacement until, is yeah. appointed. He's retiring, but he, he's still yeah. on that. That that committee meets all year round. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, as a chair of a standing committee, if the rules come out of the Agency of Natural Resources, I am sent the proposed rule, and mm -hmm. I have a sign-off uh, power. And uh, they ask me, is the proposed rule? implementing the intent of the legislature, going beyond the intent of the legislature, or arbitrary and capricious, hmm. meaning they just, it has nothing to do with what we well, ask yeah. as the policy body, or does it meet legislative intent? And I, I get to uh, check off on that. Um, so what's best practice in that, in, in that situation uh, within the legislature in terms of checking with members of the committee, um, or are you just kind of reading that as the chair, looking it over, signing it one way or the other, and then sending it back? Or are you kind of checking in with other members to say, what do you think about this? Yeah, there is um, um, a member of my committee who sits on LCAR. Okay. And um, I talk with him uh, on a fairly regular basis about rules I get to see some stuff that he doesn't, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, like internal agency procedures, okay. which do not have to go to LCAR, but do the agency does bring them to me. Okay, you know, and I share. And so we have an ongoing dialogue. Um, he doesn't always follow my advice, I must admit, but um, you know, there is that that uh, dialogue. Um, the other thing is that an advocacy um, or citizen interest, um, if they were to get in touch with Mike or I, mm -hmm. and if the issue was coming down to a position in front of LCAR, and we were to contact uh, one of the men, uh, members of LCAR, um, Patsy is uh, on, yeah, French is on uh, LCAR, he could get in touch with Patsy and okay. probably have a lot of influence in terms of what her stance would be. I can get in touch with uh, Representative Krebs, okay. um, uh, who is the uh, representative on my committee and have some influence okay. with him. So that's all. That's, yeah, that's yeah. Good. going to your local rep is a way to communicate to that. To, okay. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Next year, what, what's your agenda so far? I know we haven't even been elected, <laughs> right? But, uh, <laughs> um, presuming I do go back, um, and then uh, you know, uh, uh, you and I face one: we have an election for the speaker, and then two: the speaker appoints. When when we elect the speaker, you were, you were asking earlier, um, we turn over a lot of power. And that's why it is a um, either it's a motion for the secretary to cast one ballot, uh, or it's a paper secret ballot if there's a contested race because you're turning over a lot of power. And um, you know, I could find that I'm not a chair anymore, which happened uh, after the civil unions. Um, uh, vote in the House in 2000 and came back and I used to be a chair. Um, so um, that was a switch in party power yeah, though. Yeah, switch in party. Yeah, yeah, right. And how long is the elected position held? 
How long is the term? Two years. For the term. Oh, for the term. Two, yeah. Two years. Yeah. yeah. For the for the full session. Yep. I don't think there's in history there's ever been one recalled. Assuming <laughs> you yes. return as chair of Fish, Wildlife, and Water Resources. Um, well, I've got two items that I know we're going to be working on. One is uh, EPA is finally going to issue the cleanup plan for Lake Champlain. And in order to implement that, having been party to all of the evolving drafts, I've even had some input into them, um, I know that there's going to need to be changes in the law in order for the agency to be able to implement that. Uh, Last year, we passed uh, H 586. Some of those, I, and it did not pass the Senate. Um, uh, some of the ideas in that will also be part of this year's legislation. In other words, we're going to go back um, to address those agricultural issues. The thing about Lake Champlain, and I just want to make sure that anybody watching this uh, understands that. The phosphorus in Lake Champlain, only a very small percentage of it comes from the immediate shoreline of Lake Champlain. Mm -hmm. Most of it comes down the rivers that feed into Lake Champlain. So addressing the phosphorus load in Champlain uh, is a matter of addressing land use practices in the watershed, yeah. up, the, up the tributaries. Uh, you know, the same way that water quality in the Connecticut River is really a function of what happens on the West River all the way to its headwaters, what happens on the Williams River all the way to its headwaters, and all of the other tributaries to the main stem of the Connecticut. Um, so agriculture uh, and agricultural practices in terms of uh, runoff from the land, and then uh, stormwater which is a matter of runoff from roads, parking lots, big buildings. Um, and that has to be dealt with if we're going to clean up the lake. And I really feel for people who uh, live and have businesses on Lake Champlain, particularly if they're water-based, because the northern end of the lake, Missisquoi Bay and St. Albans Bay, um, were an embarrassment, and they have been for the last six or seven years mm. for a state that fancies itself being as environmentally conscious as Vermont does. What's happening up there is just not acceptable. Well, so, were there algae blooms this summer again? Yes, probably the worst that they've had, and mm. in the South Lake, definitely the worst. Mm. Um, what can that algae been. do? Uh, well, first off, it smells bad, it looks bad, it kills um, aquatic organisms, and uh, it gives off a toxin that uh, can make you, me, and our animals and pets very ill. Um, but mostly, can you imagine having a lakefront uh, inn and your water is green out your dock and smells bad? And that's before the fish die, yeah. float up on the shore, and start rotting. And so, um, yeah, we, we've really got to address that. Uh, and then dams. Um, the American Society of Civil Engineers just issued their report card on infrastructure in the state of Vermont. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and they evaluate wastewater, drinking water, solid waste, roads, bridges, and dams for their structural integrity. And Vermont overall got a straight C. Mm -hmm. um, and none of the different categories were higher than a C. And they've made some uh, specific recommendations under dams that our dam safety office is understaffed uh, and we do not have uh, owner responsibility. If you own the dam, getting it inspected becomes a matter of you, you, and you, and you, and you paying for it through taxes, as opposed to your dam, right? Um, so 
they're recommending strongly that we change that and increase the staffing in that office just to make us safe. Um, and there was a problem this year in Westminster with a private dam. Yeah. yeah. Uh, gave way, washed out, washed out a road. Um, yeah. Affected Putney people, Westminster people. Uh, I mean, literally, really. Yeah, well, the, road's the road still cut. At least yeah. the last time I talked to someone that lived on okay. that road, the yeah. road's still cut. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you happen to be the last house before the cut, you have a long way to go to get around yeah. and get into yeah. uh, Putney, say, if you want to go south. So. And that was avoidable. Yes. And so a straight C, room for improvement as it would be, is so that we can create better situations so that avoidable things don't happen. Don't happen. Correct. Yeah. Um, the um, Civil Engineer Civil Engineer Association report uh, said that um, high hazard dams should be inspected annually. Now, I, I must say that the uh, the Dam Safety Office does inspect high hazard dams annually. Um, but again, it's if it's your dam, and I and all the rest of us have to pay for that inspection and. Uh, because there's, there's, right now there's no fee for that, but the moderate, the medium hazard and low hazard dams, they're lucky if they can get to them every five years. And, and who pays for that? We do. We do? Yeah. yeah. We have taxpayers. It's a it's, uh, tax-funded uh, uh, office. And who collects the profits from any dam? The dam owner. And so they do not get to share in the responsibility of maintaining it? such as inspecting it? Uh, right now they don't, and that would be one of the changes that we would make. And again, uh, we passed that bill in the House last year, and it never made it to the Senate. And I'm not criticizing the Senate, but I need to point out that... Perish the thought. Yeah, perish the thought. Um, the House Natural Resources and Energy Committee and the House Fish, Wildlife and Water Resources Committee all send our bills to the same single Senate committee. And so um, they have a pretty hard and, and tough and <clears throat> road to hoe be, because there's so much stuff that's coming at them. Logistically, it's one of the challenges of this. There's only 30 members of the Senate. There's 150 in the House. So we, we do a lot of the heavy lifting on the bigger bills to start with, like the budget and, and anything else. Uh, and, you know, giving credit to our colleagues in the Senate, they're both, they, they have to sit on two committees, and both of those committees are usually pretty full. So um, they, they do have their hands full, uh, perhaps a little bit more than, than we do. So. Yeah, so, um, but we're going to try a different tactic this year. We're going to introduce the dams bill in the Senate and start there <laughs> and then have it come over to us and uh, we'll finish it up over on our side. But um, so those are the two things that I think people might be interested in around here. Yep. Now I've been. Uh, yeah. What, have, what are you up to this coming year? The House Human Services Committee is where I've worked uh, for the four sessions. Previously, I've been in the House, and uh, Human Services is that committee which uh, is the largest um, agency, and, and Human Services Committee oversees that. It provides services, we like to say, from, from birth to grave, um, and uh, a lot in between. We, we did a lot of work uh, on mental health reform last year. Uh, we have more work to do. Uh, I just met today with people at the retreat and, uh, and heard a lot of good news. There's a lot of good work happening at the retreat. Uh, we owe them continuously a debt of gratitude uh, going back to, to the hurricanes, the tropical storm, because <coughs> less than a day's notice, they, they took a busload of patients from the, the State Hospital had to close down. They continue to take the toughest patients from around the state and um, are doing some good work. They're also one of the largest employers in the area now, and the economic benefits of having the retreat here are, are quite good. Uh, 
We uh, did a lot of work on, uh, we have a lot of work to do, I think, this year on child protection. I think there have been some stories in the news that are disturbing to all of us. Um, one of the things we have to continue doing, though, is backfilling the budget cuts we made when the Great Recession hit. Um, it's no surprise to a lot of us that the oversight for those children who have been taken from families, children and families that are under great stress, uh, there have been actually some tragedies that uh, have happened. And it hasn't surprised us because we haven't backfilled all those cuts yet. We need more people to protect children. Concurrently to that, we're still working on how to address the scourge of, of heroin and opioid addiction in this, in this state. And that has created a lot of the problems uh, in regards to children being taken from parents. Grandparents raising their, their grandchildren from parents who are addicted. And what we need to do is continue that work to get the mental health services out there, to get the addiction services out there. Um, because just like the rest of the country, Vermont is experiencing that problem. Uh, and uh, it's something we need to address. It's a complicated issue that, as the governor says, we can't arrest our way out of. We, um, we need to have treatment. Treatment is uh, more effective than jail. It's also a lot cheaper than jail. So that's another piece that we're going to have to continue to look at. We're going to have to continue to look at adult protective services. As we have an aging population, we're finding more and more adults that are slowly slipping from being able to take care of themselves to self-neglect. It's an issue that's, that's growing. It's difficult mm -hmm. sometimes to spot. There's also the issues of uh, exploitation of senior citizens that we need to look at. Um, one of the things that we have done some work on with the leadership of the governor is to focus on early education, pre-K. We know that our kids are going to do better if, if they're ready for school. And uh, what the governor has been promoting and we've been working towards for a long time is, is quality child care from infant to age three and then quality preschool and, and universal access to that. Right here in Putney, we have uh, pre-K uh, for four and five-year-olds that are, uh, or three, four and five-year-olds before kindergarten. And uh, we understand that we want to get more of that out there for kids. When kids don't do well in school, we can trace it back to, uh, to early education. Now, Chad's here. Chad's part of the, the Building Bright Futures Coalition. Mm -hmm. um, what are you looking to see in that area? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm actually really glad you, you mentioned that. So um, my name is Chad Simmons. I'm the um, new Regional Council Coordinator for Building Bright Futures. We're a statewide organization that um, our charge is to improve the early childhood system uh, across the state. Um, and uh, we have 12 regions through the, the AHS districts that we represent, and I'm uh, in charge of the Brattleboro district, so almost all of Wyndham County. Um, the things that we're looking at in terms of priority is uh, kind of jibes with what you're talking about, so this is great that you mentioned that, is increasing the quality of early learning experiences, um, so zero to eight. Um, and we're hoping to also improve um, the, the family uh, kind of structure. So look at some of the, the pieces that um, support families, um, uh, uh, increased or uh, livable wages, um, access to health care. So obviously the connection with yeah. the move for universal health care, um, paid sick time off. Uh, we're really hoping to engage the business community to look at the connection of um, support for our, our youngest um, uh, children and how that relates to a thriving economy. Um, so these are kind of the, the issues that we're hoping to focus on here in Southeast Vermont. Um, and, and really, I'm, my goal at this point in, um, in my relatively new role is to really listen and hear what parents are experiencing 
how they're interacting with the early childhood system and what's working well for them and what's not and and understand some of the barriers so for instance um, the cost of child care um, of high quality child care mm -hmm. um, and the accessibility um, you know we're you know we're excited and hopeful for uh, universal pre-k yeah. um, and that allows uh, all children um, uh, to have access to high quality learning experiences but we're also recognizing the capacity issue um, that um, by allowing more children to have access um, there will be a capacity issue um, the other thing is transportation uh, I think I, previous to doing this work, I did substance prevention and uh, transportation to services is, uh, is an issue for, for many in, in our part of the state. Yeah. Um, so looking at how parents are able to, to access services. Um, so I think we're, we're looking at a multitude of things. We're working on a strategic plan to prioritize how we're going to, uh, as an organization, um, uh, implement the early childhood framework uh, and action plan. Yeah. So um, we'll definitely be working quite closely with you in your role um, in the committee and um, in other legislators. Yeah. yeah. Well that transportation issue is something that certainly continues in rural Vermont to be yeah. a challenge. Yeah, it came up yeah. when we were in Westminster yeah. okay. on Tuesday. Yeah. Also. Yeah. Whether it's for families with young children, senior citizens yeah it's 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 one of those coming problems that again we're going to have to look at as uh the aging of our country and of vermont continues vermont has the second highest percentage of retirees people over 65 in the country maine is first but uh as we continue to age um, how we get around is going to be a huge issue yeah um well Good luck in your work and look forward well, to yeah, thank you. those places we can dovetail. Sure. Uh, um, big picture, uh, you know, we're going to be back looking at health care reform, or health insurance reform, I should say, because we're, we're trying to create access through uh, moving towards single-payer system. This is going to be a, a big year in terms of figuring out how we, how we pay for that. The money's there. We're not looking to spend more money than we currently spend as a state. It's just how do we get it from here to here um, in, in a way that feels equitable for people. Uh, another big issue that we're looking as a state, you know, we're a small state, but we all have to do this, and that's it's climate change. One of the things we've been experiencing is what we call the new normal. Towns that are preparing for more floods, uh, you can only have so many hundred-year floods within a ten-year period, and we've had a couple already. This part of the state, along Lake Champlain, we, we set a new record two years ago, was it? Yep. Uh, on lake, the, the level of water in the lake. Uh, it is an issue here in Vermont. It's an issue everywhere. What we can do about that, uh, we have to start figuring out. And the next steps uh, are gonna take some sacrifice. The low-hanging fruit's been, been picked already. Uh, from what we can tell, uh, research has shown the biggest piece we need to address in Vermont is our vehicle use. 57% uh, of our carbon footprint is com comes from our cars. The, the goal is to get, to do less driving, to get more cars off the road and address that. And why I think it's important for Vermont to continue on that is there's a lot of ways Vermont has led the nation. Uh, this is another area where we can show how things work. Uh, going back 20 years, we, we passed some of the first laws on discrimination uh, against gays and lesbians. That led to the, the first state to pass a, a civil union bill. Uh, and then we became the first state to pass a marriage equality bill not compelled by a court. I think that's the, the yeah. delineation. Yeah. In, in a lot of ways, what we did in Vermont set the stage for around the nation. And Civil unions in 2000 yeah. set the stage, it really did. Yeah. So we, we led, we can continue to lead in, in that way. So it's going to be a, a huge piece. Um, another piece we've been hearing about lately, uh, as people were paying their property tax bills this year, 
is that there's a lot of questions about what's the best way to continue to fund, what's the most fair way to fund education, and what's, how do we right size uh, the cost of education to what people can pay. Uh, we, I feel like we have good schools in Vermont. We want to continue to do, the, do well by our children. That's the future of Vermont. What can people afford to pay, though? Um, we represent three towns that traditionally have really supported education well, but there's some tough decisions that are coming mm -hmm. up. Uh, the trajectory of the cost of education is not sustainable. Uh, and you work in town hall, you've been hearing it. Oh, I uh, definitely. I've been hearing it. Uh, in uh, Putney alone, we have 7% of our land yeah. is in education. And these are private schools. That's this right. is not our public mm. system. Right. These are private schools. Yeah. And it makes a big difference. Yep. I mean, right now, it's 77 cents on every tax dollar is education yep. based. That's a lot. Yep. It's a lot. And, and people are asking questions at the same time they, we want to continue to support education at every level, but um, especially as people age, the, the level of tax burden people can carry is, is, is changing. And the current system we have was the result of the Brigham decision by the Vermont Supreme Court to make sure that educational opportunity was equal across Vermont. We had a study done a few years ago, the PICA study, which said we've done that. We've achieved a lot of the goals for equal opportunity, and that's what the law that was passed originally said. It was about equal opportunity. It's, I think, what, 18 years old now? What uh, study did you say that was? The PICA study? Uh, the PICA, P-I, it's the, the yes, firm we hired. To, Got it. Yeah. And, and it's, it's on the legislative website. Okay. And it's 18 years old. So it's probably, there's a lot of laws that we're looking at to bring into the 21st century, this may be one of them that we need to look at. Around the state, we're hearing from a lot of other people, a lot of legislators are hearing this. It's, it's probably something we're gonna take a good hard look at this year. Um, um, yeah, I, what I wanted to do, I wanna marry those two major issues, if you will, uh, climate change and um, taxes, tax policy generally. Uh, many economists, many uh, policy um, uh, voices feel that one of the most effective ways to reduce your carbon footprint is with a carbon tax. And um, I am prepared to introduce a carbon tax bill uh, this year uh, if I get up there. In preparation for that, uh, I am a member of the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators. And we had a, uh, a meeting, um, must have been August. Time flies when you're having fun. Um, and a bunch of us from the New England area uh, caucused. Uh, and we, at least the people in that room, are convinced that um, a carbon tax is what's going to be necessary in order to see, particularly in the transportation sector, we've done home heating, we have efficiency in Vermont out there with businesses, um, you know, we uh, get much of our power from hydro sources. Um, I could go on about that for a while, but that it's the, it doesn't have a carbon footprint. Uh, and the biggest source is uh, our automobile use. We're a rural area, I understand that completely. A carbon tax potentially is a regressive tax so that it would impact uh, low-income families more than um, uh, higher in income families. But the concept behind the uh, idea that those of us that were in that room from the New England states was that it would be a revenue neutral carbon tax. And what that means is that 
money that is raised through the carbon tax would offset other existing taxes. Such as? Property tax. Okay. How's that? I'd like to hear more. Okay. <laughs> um, so so but, not be used to fund other things to combat climate change. But you No, the it's the tax itself that's combating climate change. Yeah. It's the fact that you're gonna pay more for your gasoline. But you're gonna pay potentially it, it, this is all speculation in terms of where that revenue might go, you would pay less in your property tax. Or and uh, I don't know if any you have businesses here in the Connecticut River Valley what if we uh, took on our most regressive tax, which is our sales tax, and took it out of the mix or took it down to uh, one, two, or three percent, as opposed to the six percent it is now, by putting money into the education fund, relieving the pressure on mm. the sales tax. And the theory is the tax inspires changes in behavior. Right. Yeah. You tax what you don't want. Okay, but then if you're going to tax what you don't want, you have to give an alternative to the people who are paying the tax. There are a great many people who are having trouble paying property taxes now. Mm -hmm. And the idea that they would then have to pay an extra tax for their gas to offset their property tax, where is, where is it going to come off of on this end? Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, where? If we have 77 cents going to education and 24 cents runs the municipal machine, where does it come from? It comes from the carbon tax. In other words, you reduce the 77 cents. Okay, so with it's the on proceeds, the side. with the proceeds from the carbon tax. Okay, so it's at thirty dollars a ton of carbon discharge, it raises a lot of money. A lot of money and as opposed to having to create a programmatic response right. to climate change we're just telling you it's going to cost more to put carbon in the air it's what you're doing is billing for the externality you're creating a cost for the externality of putting carbon into the air mm -hmm. and um, so anyhow let me go back to the, the group of us that sort of hatched this out what we want to do is uh, introduce the same bill in all five New England states cool. this year so that um, it's, you know, and we actually invited New York to come in with us, even though they're not New Englanders. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and so that we're, we're, Vermont's not going to be an island. That, that uh, in idea. terms of considering this is a real issue, this should be done at the federal level. Absolutely, I understand that completely. The feds, if, if the Congress was on fire, they couldn't figure out how to get out the door. And, uh, you know, we're tired of that. It's time to take on carbon at a, at a real level, make it revenue neutral, mm -hmm. not looking to increase cost to anybody, and then uh, use the proceeds here uh, in Vermont and New Hampshire, I mean, if state government wants to reduce property taxes. Mm -hmm. All right, they just do. Mm -hmm. And okay, that's where we'll do it. Connecticut, I don't know, they might want to uh, underwrite their sales tax uh, yeah. and reduce that. Um, so hopefully we can do it a little different than the GMO labeling bill because we are out there on our own. Although there were other states thinking about, yeah wanting to they put those triggers in like connecticut put in a trigger that mm -hmm. when four other states pass their bill their bill will, will come into effect we didn't want to wait on that we we wanted to move forward so we're out there on our own yeah and, my my draft is but a trigger they they're gonna this this the is idea is for all these to go together all to go together yeah, okay and good. there's a cadre of legislators in all five of the new england yeah. states who yeah. are prepared or were prepared when we got together in August, I I've, I've took the responsibility of drafting the bill and I, it's a very, very complicated 
uh, issue yeah. uh, in, in terms mm -hmm. of trying to figure it out. Yeah. Uh, but I think we finally got it, and I, I, I finally got the draft back from Legislative yeah. Council uh, yesterday, uh -huh. or day before yesterday, and my work has just yeah. been too much to get to it. But I think we have a bill, and, and now, shortly after Election Day, presuming those of us that agreed to do this, all go back to our state legislatures. Um, uh, we will um, follow through. Yeah. So that marries the two issues. The, the, what we're hearing is um, we have to do something about climate change. We have to do something about property taxes in our state. Yeah. Other states have other mm -hmm. priorities. I, this is sort of a win, 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 win situation. Yeah. So is that how you're hoping to frame the issue when you, when you go back to the legislature, um, assuming that you are yeah. invited back, um, to frame it as here's the win-win scenario that we came up with, yeah. uh, knowing that a tax on carbon is extremely politically um, challenging to overcome? Well, uh, at, the, uh, at the meeting, it was interesting the the uh, the staff of uh, the National Caucus of Environmental Legislators put together a meeting for us um, three days. Uh, we couldn't even eat breakfast without having a speaker, <laughs> uh, you know, giving us uh, information. I, it was uh, three very intense days, and not all the people at that that meeting were of. Uh, my identified party. I mean, th th these these are, you know, other states do have Aiken Republicans, you know, Stafford Republicans, um, mm -hmm. and um, conservatives who believe in conservation. Yep, yeah. and uh, they even brought in speakers from the Tea Party. Mm -hmm. And at the national level, uh, the deal is revenue neutral. Yeah. And they're willing to consider it because people are really starting to understand this is real. This isn't, you know, tree huggers trying yeah. to foist something off yeah. on people. This is real. And uh, when you have a um, an admiral, um, I, I think a vice chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff give you a breakfast talk about how the Navy thinks this is real, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, so it, yeah. very broad spectrum of people. <clears throat> Revenue neutral, do with it what you want, be aware that it's a regressive tax, take on and reduce a re regressive tax. Yeah. So, so yeah. I did want to, for the record, say I do support what we did for GMOs. Uh, and, and just to remind people, uh, we are crowdsourcing our, our defense fund for that. And if you want to go mm -hmm. to the website, uh, foodfightvt.org, you can contribute to that. And people are contributing. Um, my only hope is that more states join us. And uh, I'm glad Vermont's taken the lead on mm -hmm. that. Yeah. Um, are there... Well, it's early days with GMOs, yeah. and it's good that we are leading the front. Yeah. It, and people do look to Vermont. I mean, many people in the nation look yeah. to Vermont. I mean, we have a quality of life here yep. worth preserving yep. and worth supporting. But it does need to be tweaked around the edges so that people can afford to live here. You bet. We have an aging population. Yep. You said that the program that allowed for the state to equalize um, education is 18 years old. Yeah. Those 18-year-old babies are out yeah. there trying to pay for college. Yeah. And it's frightening how much Oh, it you is. bet. Even with in-state tuition, I have someone in college, and I will yeah. say that um, I only have one, and it's frightening. I it, don't know what people do with several children. Yeah. But he had suggested that college students go for a solid block of two years or two and a half years, not summers off, because it used to be you could take oh, summers off yeah. and you could help offset your next semester's tuition. It isn't like that. So if they go in a think tank t 
tight environment for two or two and a half years. It's an interesting idea, yeah. Hmm. And then leave, you know, and then graduate. And then maybe even do some kind of uh, internship yep. for, the, for the very last semester after they graduate, allowing for some placement of jobs. Yep. And also allowing for more business to have highly educated think tank, brand new, yeah. out of the shoot individuals. Now, these are good ideas, and I, I want to remind people we love getting ideas from you. Hmm. Uh, the, the best ideas come come from everyday Vermonters. We we like to hear ideas like that, and and and, and we do take them and, and act on them. So, uh, if you have ideas, you can get in touch with us. Um, at the when BCTV puts this on, uh, they'll put our contact information on the screen so you can get get in touch with us. Uh, we we love to hear from you. If you have concerns, for instance, uh, we've had a lot of concerns about people having trouble getting signed up with Green Mountain Healthcare. There's lots of ways we can help. Uh, we can make some phone calls, loosen up a log jam for something that's been happening. Uh, for other things, if people are, are not getting the heating assistance, if their roads uh, are, are not being taken care of, we, we want to hear from you. There's a lot of things that we can help with. We might not, not have all the answers, but we know people uh, who, who we can talk to, especially when we're up in Montpelier from January to May. That 16-week session keeps us up there, and, and we're right there where all the other people are that can open those doors for you. So feel free to be in touch with us. Um, yeah, most of them are at the state house. <laughs> right. Yeah. At, you know, during the day. Well, I'm, I apologize, but I was at my neighborhood potluck, and it was more important than coming here right at six. But I do have a couple of things. One of is what really, really concerns me is housing, affordable housing in the state. And if we talk about keeping young people here, We've got a major issue, major issue. And on Monday nights, I have a gathering of young people that come after my Tai Chi class, and it's a major issue. Yeah. One of them's living up on the top of Bemis Hill, yeah. way out in the Parker Brush, and is a doctor, a chiropractic doctor here, couldn't find affordable housing. You know, it's a terrible situation, terrible situation for this area, and particularly Putney area. That's, one the That's all over the state, either. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're right; it's a huge challenge that yeah. we, we're, you know, we, we are working with the Vermont Co Conservation Housing Board, and they're doing yeah. a lot of good work. The land trusts are, but we can do more. That's for sure. Yeah, I'd like to see even some of these uh, modular houses come yeah. in and put in quick. I know there's rehab on Old Depot Road, yeah. and that would be our first really yeah. uh, addressing it. Elder. Housing, well, Putney uh, Meadows is helpful, but we, we've got a major issue because it's, it's, it's it, with the wages that people are making, yep. you can't afford it. The other is... Well, we finally got the land trust doing a in project in Putney, and we're hoping that's the next step to get more, to, yeah. to, to get more, because there, there wouldn't be affordable housing around here without the land, the, the Wyndham Windsor the Housing Trust. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the uh, other is the issues of accessibility and, uh, uh, you mean accessibility for people with handicap? Well, that's right. I, I'm yeah. going, I was going over there. Accessibility with people with challenges, develop uh, 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 handicap, physical handicaps. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, I, my understanding is Vermont is like number two in the nation for a good heart and failure. Good heart to put in ramps and failure because no, there is no enforcement with the uh, federal ADA. regulations. There's ne zilch. So, uh, in Brattleboro, at the, at the uh, post office, that was rebuilt twice, and it still doesn't meet the standards. Yeah. So, I was mm -hmm. on a committee in Brattleboro, an accessibility committee, and then was on one in Putney, but we just laid it down. It was not going to, we did a few things, but it, it can't, there's no enforcement, and that's a tragic thing, and I would like to see some uh, major attention go to that, because in the blink of an eye, you could be in the wheelchair, or you. So, or blind, or whatever. Right, yeah. So, I think that a lot of times we think about it, oh, she's got Parkinson's, or he's uh, got MS. We don't think that in the blink of an eye, any one of us could be in that situation. I'd like to see equal emphasis put on that, that believe it or not, we put on drugs in the state, because 
people will say, oh, I don't see them. No, they don't come out. Who are they in wheelchairs and need to get around? Because they can't get there. Yeah. You can't get there. And mm -hmm. I remember at Hooker Dunham challenging that. And so finally, the Vermont Arts Council and the federal uh, uh, regulations said, we're not giving money to places that have programs that we're funding that are not accessible. Yeah. So it's a, it's a major problem, yeah. but for to have somebody say to me, an intelligent person, even I had to challenge the guy who rented Phil Fermonti a few years ago, he was gonna put Bernie Sanders down the hooker gun. I said, what? I said, I'll be out there picketing. You can't do that. Yeah. You can't do that. And no, people, the thing is now, I talked to the head of the Arts Council last Saturday night because he was down at the Jazz Award and I said to him, he said, oh, you're the one that stirred the oatmeal. I said, well, I stirred it and somebody else picked it up. But the thing is, there, one, there's no follow through or enforcement of the regulations, and two, people do not ask. Whenever you're doing something in a place, here you are, it's accessible. But think about that yeah. and mention that yeah. in the halls of power. Yeah. It fits into what we were talking about before. As we get older, mm -hmm. we're all losing a little bit and, and that we need to think about how we're going to make make the way for for those of us who are aging? Because it's, mm -hmm. it's it's the other thing that's happening to us yep. all. Yeah. Yep. Anyway, that was my two pieces that I've really because I woke up out of a dream about this affordable housing because I have such yeah. an impression on me these young people, and I could name many of them. Yeah. And I, every, I think everybody that builds a new house yeah. should build a little <laughs> apartment in it to be able to rent. Well, I think more you of know us, where we live. Yeah. We live. Mm -hmm. We David Dean. I lived in Alice Hallways. Great kind of money. She ran a boarding house. We were lucky to have a place to stay. Were yeah. we not? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. So when I'm, I first got here. I'm wondering if, because um, I, I think affordability, housing affordability is a huge issue, especially for families yeah. um, and young people. Uh, there was a great segment on NPR the other day about uh, young people and, exactly. yeah, and uh, housing being one of the, the major issues. But I'm wondering if we can marry some of yeah. the, uh, the issues around climate change and housing. Um, I, I know Efficiency Vermont is now doing some community forums and listening sessions in terms of what's next for Efficiency Vermont. Yeah. And, you know, as in Southern Vermont, living in Southern Vermont, we have such an old, inefficient housing stock. Yeah. And I, I, I'd love to see that be tackled um, yeah. as, as a priority for Efficiency Vermont and putting resources into that. Um, and improving the efficiency of our housing stock and uh, give resources for, for families and, um, and, and landlords to improve the, the efficiency as well as the, the, um, um, the, the longevity of our housing stock. And I think that will help with the affordability if there is some mechanisms. Um, you know, what Efficiency Vermont does with light bulbs, that's great. Yeah. Um, but I think we need to kind of Good take point. the next step um, and, and look at something larger. And I think that would yeah. really help. It, it's a good point. A lot of us are talking in the same way that we need to find a dedicated funding source for that so we can expand. Yeah. What happens primarily for low-income Vermonters now up into other demographics, because when you look at the other largest piece of our carbon footprint, it's our housing stock that's, that's heating the atmosphere. And, and we all know on the other end of it, the cheapest energy is the one we don't have to produce. Yeah. And whether it's electricity, whether it's heating uh, efficiency and, and conservation are really the ways to go. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to produce as much or use as much. Uh, so I totally agree with you. The challenge for us is gonna be how do we designate that, that dedicated funding source um, right. to, to help people. You know, we started some programs uh, to offer low cost loans a lot of people can't take on another loan. Exactly. Especially if yeah. you've got kids in college. Uh, so we need more grants. The, the payoff in the long term helps all of us. So I, it's one way to look at it. So uh, it, it is something we're mindful of and that we need to take that next step and, and dedicate a funding source to it because otherwise I don't think it's going to happen. Yeah. The, the, the loan program didn't take off the way we, we hoped it would because a lot of people just can't carry that. Uh, mm -hmm. a, a, another loan, even if it's low or no interest, uh, it, it's beyond what a lot of people can carry. Yeah, it, it really should have been a lean program. Yeah. Uh, 
and at mm -hmm. the point where the kids are through college yeah. and uh, you're still living in the place and you can pay it off, the lien comes yeah. off the property. Yeah. Um, but, you know, uh, it, and it should, in my opinion, be eligible for funding in the capital bill yeah. because it's a long-term asset right. yeah. um, that uh, we value in the state of Vermont, which yeah. is efficient energy efficient housing mm -hmm. uh, to drop those yep. out of pocket monthly costs. What was the the person in that interview was paying like three or four thousand dollars a year for energy? <laughs> you know? Wow. Yeah. And just think if you free up yeah. that three or four thousand dollars for other expenditures, yeah. it will go to other segments of the economy. Yeah. And probably have more of a ripple effect since all fossil fuel purchases siphon money out of the state. Yeah, you know it would probably uh, do something for the state economy. Mm -hmm. I remember when you worked on those. You were working at Sefka, and we had those Sefka stoves. Yeah. Those you take those uh, old fuel tanks or mm -hmm. whatever they were. Go. One Cut of them, them on, the other one on the <laughs> top, put it together, and you know you were interested in energy, uh, saving energy and energy efficiency back then. But you know that's where we went first to the wood stove because we right. had to go back to that. Yeah. Nobody could afford that. Yeah. 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 yeah, fossil yeah. fuels. Yeah, fossil fuels. But I want to thank you for the good work you've done on clean water in the state. Uh, the Connecticut River project, the good work there, but also in general that runoff is a major issue for our lakes and streams. And I really appreciate, David, what you've done. Yeah, we Both spoke about it earlier. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, okay. yeah, a little bit. There you yeah. go. But thank you. Yeah, and Mike, you're doing pretty good for those of us. When I have to whine and moan about uh, certain uh, entitlement programs, uh, you've stood up for me, and I appreciate it. Yeah. yeah. Well, there's a lot of people that are going to need those home services, yeah. and we need to keep trying to do a better job around that. So I also want to thank both of you for everything that you're doing uh, on our behalf in the State House. Um, I did want to mention there and invite you both sure. and everyone to two. Is a movie events. coming up? Yes, yeah. Um, uh, next week, Tuesday, uh, October 28th at the Latches from 5.30 to 7.30, we're screening a sneak peek of the film uh, Raising of the Raising of America, which looks at how this nation is doing, um, uh, how we're doing as a country, raising our kids, um, and we're having a great panel discussion that, to follow um, that looks at what we're doing in Southeast Vermont around uh, early childhood and supporting our kids. The second is we're gonna have a, a community and legislative forum on Monday, December 8th. I sent both of you a, um, an invite this morning and that's gonna really be focused on what's working really well in, in uh, early childhood and what can we do to improve and that we'll have some more specific kinds of things that we can look at in the next legislative session uh, to improve our system. So hopefully folks can, and that's open to the public. Mm -hmm. Good, thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, any other questions? I vote that you go home and eat some supper. Motion to adjourn. <laughs> I want to thank BCTV, yeah, thank you. Our, our intrepid camera woman thank here. Thank you. Yeah, and the awards that have been won by BCTV. Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's an award uh, B, winner right there. BCTV has been doing some great work to open up the community to, to people, open up windows so other people can see all parts of what's happening, and especially our work in Montpelier, to help bring it closer to you here. So thank you.